Welcome to another episode of the VM Blog Expert Interview Series. And today we're once again joined by John Egan, the co-founder and CEO of Tentaba. John, welcome back. Hey, David. Thanks for having me. So uh, for those folks who may not have watched our previous conversation with one another, why don't you give us a quick background on who Kentaba is? No problem. Uh, so Kentaba is an incident management platform. Uh, we're a SaaS product, uh, self-service, easy for anyone to sign up. And we're designed to make it so that any organization can come in and handle incident response across the entire company uh, or maybe just a team uh, in as little as 10 minutes setup time, as opposed to the months of time that it tends to take larger enterprises to do this kind of implementation. And, you know, right now there, there seems to be a lot of interest in the uh, incident management space recently with a lot of new players coming into the market. Why do you think that is? Yeah, so I'm first of all, I think it's it's great, right? This is this is sort of what we predicted when we started building this company, and it's what you generally want to see is there should be you know sort of a, a rush, right, on exciting new land. Um, but I think there are a lot of different factors that are causing an increased interest in the space. Um, you know, at the base level, I think more and more companies are realizing that real time response to to incidents is really part of daily operations. It's not just an emergencies problem, and this is something we talked a little bit about last time, I think. Um, which was part of kind of the core idea of getting Kentaba up and off the ground, is we're seeing this general movement in organizations from a state of saying, well, you know, we have one or two incidents a month, maybe, and our goal is to get that down to zero, to sort of recognizing that the reality is you actually have a lot of these things happening throughout the month of varying degrees of severity. And having a tool to help your team do a collaborative real-time response in a consistent way so that you're not wasting a bunch of administrative time every time you uh, are, are dealing with an outage or you're dealing with a, a high priority um, situation, uh, it just makes sense to go and have a better tool in place to go and handle that. I think though, in addition to that, things that have changed over the last couple of years are the continued embracement of uh, remote work has had a huge impact on this, right? So maybe in the old days, in the, in the before times, we could uh, all crowd behind a computer screen when things went bad and have uh, you know kind of real-time conversation with each other about what to do. And the coordination, a lot of it was vocal, and then it would be translated occasionally you know, into digital where maybe you do a, a blast out to the organization of what the status is. But now, um, you know, even, even the SRE teams, even the response teams that would traditionally work with the largest of outages are distributed. Some are going to be in Colorado, some are going to be in North Carolina, some are going to be overseas. And you start to really need those uh, digital scaffoldings to come into place to help those teams respond quickly so you're not wasting a bunch of time when you're trying to get up and running when previously maybe you could cut that out with kind of physical interaction. Um, I also think when you, when you think about remote teams and you think about distributed uh, groups of people, it's more important that you acquire those tools off the shelf because you actually want someone else generally to host your incident response team, or sorry, not team, your incident response platforms, because when you're responding, oftentimes the thing that's down will be your infrastructure. And if you built in-house, you can suffer from that. We actually saw this really recently with the Facebook outage, where one of the largest problems that they reported in terms of trying to respond to that outage was they didn't have... Um, digital access to communicate with each other anymore because the systems that went down were the same systems that they were reliant on to, to support, I think, their production environments. And so I think, you know, that's all of these things have kind of come together, right? And they were all just bubbling above the surface. And all of a sudden, you know, we had this, this boil over event over the last two years, and it's caused a lot of these things to become true. And you get to this bit of a snowball effect, right? Kind of a positive snowball effect, actually, which is more and more companies see other companies using incident response tools, not just running to a random Slack channel. And they're seeing the value in that. Um, and so I think those are kind of the major things that are pushing people, you know, into the space and, and getting more excited about it. So you mentioned Slack, uh, you know, when we when we think about how teams are dealing with incidents, if they don't have a, a tool like Kentaba, uh, is it is it Slack and email? Uh, what are they using to try to coordinate uh, responding to to big problems? Yeah, so I, I think a lot of organizations are really living in a in a state of you know I almost just call it panic when things go badly, right? It's almost an accepted state. It's almost like saying, okay, when things are really bad, we're okay with everyone just panicking. And panic today does mean running to whatever your first responder 
um, collab tool happens to be. And that might be Slack. You might go run into a Slack channel and try to find the right one and post into it and say, okay, let's deal with this here. Maybe you open up a thread, maybe you start another channel. Um, maybe you've run to email if your company's not on Slack. You know, some organizations, maybe you're spinning up a Zoom. But the problem here is if you don't have that established methodology, if you don't have that separate tool, you end up getting a lot of these things that start to duplicate themselves, right? Especially when you have a major outage, let's say you have an infrastructure level outage. Each team will go and start responding to that independently and the information won't be shared very effectively. It'll be tough to know where to go. And it actually gets worse kind of as you go up the chain, right? As you get up to higher and higher level people who are trying to get input into what's going on or sorry, uh, output in, in to, about what's going on. And they'll go and search and find the first resource that they stumble onto, which might not be the right one. And that's where you start to get all of that communication overhead challenge, right? If, a, uh, if an executive goes and tries to figure out what's going on and they end up in the wrong channel of the responders, not the right responders who are really dealing with it, you get thrash, right? Suddenly you're going across at the executive level and then back down and you have all of these different communications happening. And the poor, you know, usually small set of engineers that are actually trying to solve the problem, like end up getting thrashed at the end of the day. Uh, so yeah, so we're, we're using those types of tools um, and we're just kind of running to what we have. And I think it's pretty important when you want to have process, right? When you want to have good process, that you really want to have a tool that enforces that process, that enforces that kind of sanity of how are we going to deal with these things that require real-time group response where we want auditing of what happened, where we want to make sure that we learned, Um because after you get past something like the Slack or the email, once the incident ends, right, that's, that's a whole other set of tools, right? Okay, what are we using now? How are we coming together to talk about what just happened? How are we making sure it never happened again? And if you're relying just on a tool like Slack, it, it, you know, it can just end with the collaboration. You can say, okay, great, you know, Facebook's back up, Roblox is back up, you know, whatever has gone down is back up and that's the end of it. And an incident response process, you're actually, no, you're not, you've just begun right now. Now you need to figure out what went wrong and systemically solve it so it doesn't go wrong again. And I know Kentaba has a new product that they're uh, announcing called uh, human-centric heat maps. I'm really interested in learning more about this. Um, you know, in tech, there's a lot of conversations about machines coming in and fixing all of our problems. So it's refreshing to see a vendor focus on the human side of things. Maybe you can tell folks a little bit more about, uh, about this new project that's coming out. Yeah, so at a really high level, we're seeing a cultural shift inside of companies that I think is really positive, right? There was, there was sort of an old saying that you, would, um, you, know, you, you wouldn't quit companies, you'd quit your manager. Right. And I think I saw something on Twitter the other, the other week where someone said, you know, yeah, you know, people don't quit managers anymore. They quit on-call rotations. <laughs> right. And, and, and the reason someone might say something like that, right, is that we more and more are impacted as, as workers, as responders, as, as product builders um, by these incidents. It's not just the customers. So as, as important as it is, right, that's first and foremost, that's usually how we define severity level, right? The customer, we need to make sure we get the product back up. We need to make sure we get revenue moving. We need to make sure we have consistency, right? But internally, you, a lot of the time, your output of an incident um, isn't just the conversation about why did that happen? How did it happen? How do we keep it from happening again? It's also what was the internal impact of that incident to the company? And what we noticed was tools really were not providing response teams, their managers, you know, company CEOs, information about how the people are being impacted inter internally. And a really simple version of this, and it's somewhere where a heat map really comes in and is, is super powerful, right, is simply saying, when do the incidents happen and who are the responders who are most impacted by those incidents? And at a very high level, you can get some really useful information like, wow, all of our incidents are happening at 2 a.m. And, you know, William is spending 99% of the time of responders dealing with these, right? You have this sudden action that comes out of an incident, right? Which isn't just... Um, let's go and make sure that we have better resilience across our database servers, right? Your output might be, wow, we're really pushing the small set of two or three people all hours of the day. And we need to A, you know, kind of work towards not making that part of those people's jobs anymore. So it's better distributed. This is why you have, you know, good on-call health and, you know, general resiliency within your team, not just your hardware. Um, you know, and also kind of brings to light the uh, the question of, okay, let's record the effort people are putting in, 
right? And let's use that positively because there's also a positive side of that, which is, wow, William's really being a hero. And this is something that we need to know inside of the company when review time comes along, right? Instead of just saying, did you get task A, B, and C done? It's like, well, no, you, you also were really working hard responding to major outages, getting these things closed out, and we were seeing positive output from that. So I think the best companies that do this kind of stuff have always taken a really human-centric view into what are the impact of incidents and how do we prevent more of them happening by also looking at the people that are involved. Um, the airline industry, right, is, is sort of your classic point for this, right? You know, what, where do we set time limits for pilots, you know, being in the air and, and the crew, right? We also set time limits on the crew and, and, and the, um, you know, the staff that are working in the cabin, all of these people. And how do we get insight into that? And it turns out a lot of that really comes from your incident response process and we can start to get access. So there's actually a whole set of additional um, charts and tooling and insights that we're rolling out over the next couple of weeks in addition just to sort of the time heat maps and the, and the individual pe person responses that just give more and more light to these people who are doing this as part of their job um, because it's not just a piece of side work. It's, it's a critical part of operating the company. And then, you know, Kentaba has some, you know, real interesting opinions on traditional incident metrics like MTTR. Why, why shouldn't companies be focused on these metrics? Yeah, you know, we, we spend a lot of time working with companies that are, you know, just getting going with, you know, their, their, their repetitive approach to incident response, right? Repeatable approach to incident response. And, and MTTR is this metric that always comes up. It always comes up in the first conversation. It's like, wow, we need to get our MTTR down. And, and companies will say this, even if they're not measuring it yet, right? It's funny. It's almost this gut reaction. It's like, we've got to get our, meet, our like response times down. Like this is, this is the thing that's really tearing us apart. Um, and what we found for, for a lot of these companies is that metric is so inaccurate especially in the early days of getting an incident response process up and running, that implementing it can actually be a really negative or have a really negative impact on the team, on the organization, because it sets all of your um, incentives incorrectly, right? If, if I'm on an incident management team and, uh, or a team that's responsible in some way for incident management and incident response, and I hear that the first thing I'm being measured on is MTTR, then I'm going to do two things as a, as a practical individual. Number one, I'm not going to file incidents as soon as I hear about them. I'm going to wait as long as I can because I know the, the clock starts ticking as soon as I click that button. Um, and all, all the way to the extreme case of maybe I won't file it at all if I can get away with it, right? And number two, um, you know, I'm heavily incentivized to do things like uh, miscategorize incidents and say, oh, this was really a SEV2. So it was okay. It fell within, you know, our, our service level goals for a SEV2. So I'm going to mark it as a SEV2. And really what you want when you're getting an incident response process off the ground is, is kind of the opposite, right? What you're trying to do is encourage, you know, extreme honesty, right? You want, you want people to be really comfortable saying everything they're doing during the incident, you know, being humble and okay with the fact that mistakes are going to be made during the response process, because that's, that's the stuff that lets you get better later on. And you also want to get that barrier to, to filing an incident as low as possible, because you want to start catching all these other incidents that previously weren't being recorded. So, it's one of these, these challenges because we'll get really mature organizations, right? We'll, we'll see people come back, especially on Twitter, right? And they'll say, no, we, we use MTTR. It's, it's very successful for us. And I'll usually say, I'll say, yeah, but you're a mature organization. You have full tooling. You've already got your positive incident culture. You're capturing these things super well. You're rewarding people correctly. So now, now it's okay for you to go and look, okay, now that we've optimized all the low-hanging fruit, we're going we're gonna to pay a little bit more attention to MTTR. And in those cases, I think it's okay, but it turns out that's, you know, 1% or less of the market that's really in that state. Most companies, if they did the other work, would actually one year down the road find themselves more resilient such that even if they didn't have quite the same MTTR gain, they're going to have a much better customer perceived uptime and resiliency, which is, which is actually your goal. Right? Your goal of all this stuff is to simply be more resilient as an organization. Your goal isn't simply to be able to pick the fire extinguisher up faster. And I think it's really important to, uh, to have those differences, right? Fire departments have been doing this, this for ages. They'll come in and they'll work really hard on like detection and prevention and all of these pieces. And yeah, response time matters, 
But, you know, first you need to get the alarms in. First you need to get the culture in. First you need to get people to not be afraid to call 911. Um, and I think that's, that's really where we kind of look negatively on the MTTR metric. Um, you know, we do have it. Certainly you, you can use Kintaba and you can find it. It's in, it's in our metrics. I just, it's funny when we talk people through these other metrics, you know, they'll sort of do a nod when we talk about MTTR as we've kind of pushed them away from it. And then we start to talk about like the human data and the, the heat maps and this other information. And they suddenly their eyes light up and it's new information. Like, wow, here's some new things we can get about incident response that's positive for our team. This doesn't just feel like something that no one really wants to go and do. Uh, well, John, I really appreciate the latest update on the company. And as always, it was great to speak with you. And uh, again, thanks for joining VMBOG today. Definitely. Thanks, David. And uh, if anyone wants to come check out Kintaba, we encourage you to come. It's kintaba.com. Uh, and it's free for the first five users and, and pretty well priced after that, I think. Perfect. Thank you. Appreciate it. Thanks. All right.